Hey, in this podcast, we're going to talk about solutions. I'm going to introduce solutions and talk to you a little bit about some different properties that are associated with them. All right, first, let's talk about some terms. Uh, you've probably heard the term solute. Solute is the substance that gets dissolved in the solution. And then solvent. Solvent is the dissolving medium or what the solute is getting dissolved in. So an example of a solute would be like salt and water, sugar and soda drinks, or carbon dioxide and soda drinks. So even a gas can be a solute. Solvent would be water and salt water or water and soda. Water is actually called the universal solvent. So nine times out of ten, it's going to be your solvent. All right. There are steps involved in uh, forming a solution. So you have a solute and you have a solvent. They have intermolecular forces holding the particles together. So first you must overcome those intermolecular forces to expand your solute and expand your solvent. After they are expanded, then they can mix together to form a solution, which is a homogeneous mixture, meaning it can't be separated. All right, solubility. Uh, what is solubility? Well, solubility is going to tell us if something is going to dissolve or not dissolve. So here, soluble is one term you need to be familiar with. It's the ability of a solute to dissolve in a solvent and form a homo homogeneous solution. And then insoluble is the inability of a solute to dissolve in a solvent and form a homogeneous solution. So here you see um, everything has dissolved, everything's broken up, all mixed throughout. And then over here you see some are, but then you've got this big clump down here at the bottom that did not dissolve. So it would be insoluble. Okay. All right, there are certain solubility rules that you need to start getting familiar with for ionic compounds. Um, you will especially need these during our reaction unit. So there are six rules and then a couple exceptions for some of the rules. So first rule, all common compounds of group one, which would be your alkali metals, and ammonium ions are soluble, and there are no exceptions to this rule. So if it's got an alkali metal or an ammonium ion attached to it, it's soluble. If it's a nitrate, an acetate, or a chlorate, it's going to be soluble, and there are no exceptions to that rule either. Third rule, all binary compounds, meaning it doesn't contain a polyatomic ion, of the halogens, okay, it's going to be group 17, uh, bound with a metal, are soluble. One example is fluorine is the halogen exception. So halogens, uh, all halogens are soluble except fluorine. And then all metals that bound are bound with a halogen are soluble except silver, mercury 1, and lead. So if any of those are combined with like a chlorine, they're still not soluble. All right, all sulfates are soluble unless it has barium, strontium, calcium, lead, silver, or mercury 1 in it. So if it's a sulfate is attached to one of those metals, it's not soluble. Uh, carbonates, hydroxides, oxides, silicates, and phosphates are insoluble, except when they're bonded to a metal or an alkali metal or ammonium ion. So that goes back to rule one. Okay, so everybody except for what's including in rule one is sol uh, insoluble if it's got a carbonate, hydroxide, oxide, silicate, or phosphate attached. And last rule, all sulfides are insoluble unless they contain calcium, barium, strontium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. Okay, so you need to start getting familiar with these rules. All right, what affects solubility? Well, the solubility of most solids is going to increase with temperature. So you increase the temperature, particles start moving faster, they're better, better able to mix in and overcome those intermolecular forces that are keeping your solute and solvent together. Um, the rate at which solids dissolves increases with increasing surface area. Okay, so if you think about an Alka-Seltzer tablet, if you put in a whole tablet versus a tablet that has been crushed up into fine powder, the rate for the fine powder would occur much, much quicker. So it's going to dissolve much, much quicker um, than a solid substance that you have not 
broken down to try to increase the surface area. All right, solubility of gases. So we talked about gases can be dissolved in a solvent. Um, they, their solubility decreases when you increase the temperature. So the faster they're going, the less gas molecules can occupy that solvent. And then the solubility of gases increases with the pressure above the solution. So there's an equilibrium between the pressure above the solution and the pressure of the gas in the solution. And if you increase the pressure above the solution, you'll also increase um, the number or the amount, the solubility of the gas within the solution. All right, therefore, solids are going to dissolve best when they're heated, they're stirred, or they're ground into small particles. Gases tend to dissolve best when the solution is cold. So like a cold, think about a Coke. That's why Cokes stay better longer have more carbonation when they stay in the refrigerator. Uh, when the pressure is high, so we talked about the pressure above the solution, uh, can force more gas molecules to be dissolved in the solution. All right, here's a solubility chart. You need to learn how to read this. Um, my key got caught off on the bottom, but this bottom, this is temperature. So this is showing you, oh, computer trying to restart there. All right, this is showing you how, as you increase the temperature, um, most of your substances solubility increases and solubility we're talking about it in grams of salt versus a hundred grams of water okay now you need to learn to read these lines uh, we're going to talk about what all this stuff means okay so first let's talk a little bit about saturation all right when a solution contains the maximum amount of sol solute that can be dissolved um, under the existing conditions of pressure and temperature it is called saturated. So here's the picture of, there's my saturated picture. Got it mixed up, okay? Middle one's my saturated picture. All right, a solution that contains less solute than the saturated solution under exist, existing conditions of temperature and pressure is unsaturated. So here you see an unsaturated solution. You see you have a lot more room to dissolve things in there versus the saturated one where you have the maximum amount dissolved. And then you have a solution that's going to contain more than what can be dissolved under existing conditions, and that's called supersaturated. So in a supersaturated solution, you see you get most of it dissolved, but then you have this clump, this crystal lattice in the middle that does not dissolve. So let's relate this back to our chart real quick. All right, so let's talk about the KCL line right here. If you are on the line at any given temperature, then that tells you that you are saturated, okay? So let's say that at 43 degrees, which would be right here, I have 40 grams of solute. That means I'm saturated. Now if I have less than 40 grams, that indicates that I am unsaturated. Okay? I have less than the maximum amount. So if at 43 degrees, say I had only 30, degree, uh, 30 grams of solute, then I would be unsaturated. Now, if at 43 degrees I had more than 40 grams, say 50 or 60 grams above the line, above the line is considered super saturated. Okay, so make sure you're familiar and comfortable with reading a solubility chart. All right. Uh, you've probably all heard the phrase, like dissolves like. If you haven't, now you have. Um, so basically what we're talking about is if you have a nonpolar solute, it's going to dissolve best in a nonpolar solvent. Okay, so like and like, nonpolar, nonpolar. Same for polar. So if you have a polar um, solute, it's going to dissolve best in a polar solvent. Now, of course, we know that polar means they have partial negative and partial positive charges on them. Um, ionic solutes also dissolve best in polar solvents because we know that when we dissolve something ionic, it breaks into positives and negatives. All right, so here's some examples of nonpolar solutes and solvents. So nonpolar solutes, fats, steroids, and waxes. Nonpolar solvents, benzene, hexane, toluene. All right, and these we're probably a little more familiar with our uh, polar and ionic stuff. Uh, polar and ionic solutes are going to be inorganic salts. It's going to be any ionic solution. 
um, and sugars. And then polar solvents are going to be your water, your small alcohols, and acetic acid, which is really just vinegar. All right, how about the terms miscible versus immiscible? Miscible is when liquids mix in each other in all proportions, forming a homogeneous solution. So you have two different liquids, you mix them together. If they all mix in real nice, like dissolves like, then they are considered miscible. Now, if you mix these liquids and they do not mix in each other to form a homogeneous solution, they are called immiscible. So here you see a picture. Uh, oil and water is a very common example here. So immiscible, like does not dissolve in no likey likey. Okay, so if you do not have the same thing, if you don't have a polar and a polar or a nonpolar and a nonpolar, it's not going to dissolve. And you're going to be immiscible, you're going to have separation of layers.